Without further ado, I'd like to pass the mic over to our moderator today, Zoe Victoria Tate, Regional Technical Specialist Eco for Ecosystems and Incubation at the United Nations Capital Development Fund. Zoe, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Robert, um, and good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Uh, thank you for joining us on this webinar today. Uh, it's great to see so many of you signing in from the Pacific and beyond. Uh, so my name is Zoe Victoria Tate, um, and I am a technical specialist with the United Nations Capital Development Fund based in the Solomon Islands. But today I am hosting you from Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. And it is my pleasure to host you today and to facilitate this conversation about such an important topic. How can we safeguard human rights in business and how can we build inclusive digital economies together? So today's session will be just over one hour. Uh, so let me dive right in. Um, uh, safeguarding human rights in business as well as building inclusive digital economies is a key focus area um, of UNCDF's work under the Pacific Digital Economy Program. Um, and today I have the pleasure of not only um, representing my organization, but also hosting two specialists on this topic from the United Nations Development Program and from the Australian Human Rights Commission. And they will be sharing their experiences and their work with us today as well through a short presentation about their work. Um, as Robert already mentioned, uh, I, I really invite you to share your questions uh, and comments with us. Uh, you must already be familiar with the chat function and the Q&A, which you can find on the bottom of the screen. Um, and towards the end of the session, I will be very happy to open up our conversation uh, and formulate some actionable next steps right together with you in the audience. So without further ado, let me introduce you to our speakers today. Uh, we are joined by uh, Ms. Harpreet Kaur, who is a business and human rights specialist at the United Nations Development Program, a regional center for Asia and the Pacific. So good morning, Harpreet, and welcome. Morning, Zoe. Morning, everyone. Hello. Good morning. Good afternoon, good evening, whichever part of the world you're joining today from, and thank you for inviting. Yes, exactly. Um, I think uh, all time zones represented today. Um, secondly, I also have the pleasure of introducing you, you to Ms. Uh, Zoe Paleologos, who is a senior policy advisor at the Australian Human Rights Commission. Hi, Zoe. Hello, Zoe. Hello, everyone. Great to be here with you. All right, and those are our two speakers for today. Um, before we dive into some presentations about the work that they do, which I am sure uh, you will all find very interesting uh, to learn about, maybe we can just set the stage a little bit and hear uh, from our speakers a um, little bit more about what they do, uh, why this work is important to them, right? And um, you know how that sort of comes through into their work. So a little introduction, and maybe I can start by uh, giving the floor to Harpreet Kaur. Please share with us a little bit about your personal backgrounds and motivations and why you work in this field. Thank you. Sure. Thanks, Zoe. And good morning again, everyone. At least this is morning for us. Uh, I'm Harpreet Kaur, the Business and Human Rights Specialist, and I'll have to remember to go slow. Uh, Zoe, if I go too fast, uh, give me a cue. Um, so, you know, in our work, I'm an anthropologist by training and a lot of uh, work experience working on governance and business and human rights issues. In fact, uh, focusing on business and human rights issues for over a decade now. I think I've had the pleasure um, and actually the privilege to work with, you know, really senior um, and, you know, some of these experts on business and human rights. And I think that's something that that I've always um, excited, you know, that's always been um, an, an enriching experience. And I think some of these conversations have been about, um, you know, the biases, the gender biases, the racial biases, and the intersectionality. I think, you know, all, you know, when we look at the business and human rights field, particularly, and it was to kind of sort of start talking about 
the most privileged, uh, you know, the most uh, underprivileged people and, you know, how we are looking at this business and human rights field in terms of sort of finding solutions to that. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, some of these biases continue to display. Um, in particular, the work that we do at UNDP. So at the UNDP, we provide technical and advisory support to governments and other state-based institutions on the development of national action plans on business and human rights and other policy and legal frameworks. You know, in particular, currently, we've been supporting a number of countries in Asia, including India, Indonesia, Malaysia, Vietnam, um, Thailand, Pakistan, and, you know, developing, and of course, Thailand and Pakistan have now adopted their national action plans on business and human rights. Um, we also promote corporate human rights policies, due diligence processes, remediation to ensure the enjoyment of human rights in workplace across all business sectors and types of work in, or employment in the, in the region. I think in addition, we invest in research and developing toolkits and facilitate programs such as Regional Forum on Business and Human Rights also as well to amplify the voices of right holders and highlighting the need for effective remedy. Um, Joy, I'm going to take sort of, you know, two key, I mean, of course, these, there are different fields and different activities in the project, but I'm just going to take maybe, you know, the two different uh, initiatives that we're focusing on and how, how we're looking at sort of, you know, uh, the need and the uh, you know, the need and I think really uh, important to sort of look at how do we safeguard human rights in these digital inclusive economy as we're moving towards this. Um, so, you know, as I said, we work very closely with the governments on um, supporting them on developing their national action plans. And it was, you know, it was kind of one of the reflections that we've had is, you know, a number of national action plans, uh, including Finland, France, Ireland, Japan, Luxembourg, I think even Poland and UK. I mean, all of these NAPs, I mean, one, there are very few NAPs that have uh, that specify any activities or action points or even sort of, you know, have converse, have um, have data privacy or issues about the digitization in sort of their national action plans, which means our governments thinking about these issues, you know, are when they're developing their national action plans, their strategy document, are they really looking at what is it going to be? What are going to be the impacts of digitized economies? Because all of these governments are, you know, sort of moving towards digitized economy. And I think especially with the COVID-19 pandemic, things have changed for all of us. But our government's thinking about that, particularly in the you know, context of business and human rights. And I think, as I said, you know, some of these, um, some of these countries are, there are very few countries that have a national action plan that have any reference to say data privacy or freedom of expression. But I think it's really interesting to see the Georgian National Action Plan that highlights the gender aspects of, you know, sort of digitized economy and, you know, as they move towards. In fact, they do have an indicator uh, and, you know, sort of an objective where, where they sort of talk about how they're going to ensure the knowledge of uh, business sector concerning human rights protection mechanisms and are going to include personal data protection and finer standards for strengthening women. So, you know, I think I think that's a really good example. And that's something that we've sort of started looking at when we are supporting the National Action Plan uh, process, uh, development process um, uh, in the region. Um, I would like to bring to your attention, you know, the two, uh, you know, if you look at the India's National Action Plan, which is in Pro, you know, which is sort of in the development process right now. Um, I think they are the ones who are looking at sort of the sort of the ICT sector as a as a big sector, but then also looking at the digital impacts of human rights, digital impact, you know, uh, human rights impacts of digital technologies. And I think they are one of the few who have conducted even consultations with businesses, with affected stakeholders, on what needs to be done in that context. So I think. Um, I think well, you know what we see is a really big gap in in sort of the development of national action plans, particularly in the context of digitized economies. Uh, and I think that's something that we need to sort of start working on. You know, the second aspect is where in our work we've started recently started looking at the interplay between smart cities, digital technologies, and human rights. And you know, of course, smart cities are projected by governments, by businesses as an efficient solution to urban problems using innovation in its broadest sense. Um, of course, we know how smart cities use various digital technologies, including information and communication, um, you know, achieving these digital uh, interconnectedness, but then also 
smarter urban solutions such as um, you know smart transportation water energy supply smart manufacturing data collection storage and use and i think all of these have uh, it were you know all of if if this isn't done properly all of this would have an adverse human rights could have adverse human rights impacts and i think i would like to bring um, you know to to the for um, the work that we're doing particularly in the context of you know the biases here um we all know how new technologies contribute to forming these um smart cities rely heavily on artificial intelligence system right a system that operates and learn from the data i mean both the source the consumer uh, the end consumer of these data are human beings so it you know it's it's it essentially carries all the biases all the stereotypes that we do including biases about gender including the racial biases and many other biases and i think um, you know the, all of these algorithmic biases comes from simply um, simply uploading uh, it along the everything else when we use machine learning and these can amplify and perpetuate gender and racial biases by uploading unrepresentative data sets i think uh, you know i think uh, soy is going to talk about soyp is going to talk about some of these uh, some of these adverse impacts but it's important that we look at algorithms you know they are not just the technological artifacts anymore you know it's very much part of the social institutions that reshare uh, the social relationships and also gender relations and i think um, the ai has the means and the capacity for independent reasoning and decision making i mean it's the emerging new technologies are increasing increasingly influencing our opinions our behaviors our everyday life you know and it's changing the way humans create exchange and distribute value i don't know of course uh, it was anticipated that these new technologies would rebalance our society's uh, inequity moving towards a more inclusive human centered future together but you know the field uh, the field of uh, you know as they say so the fourth industrial revolution is still sort of evolving and i think its impacts are yet to be seen uh but of course uh, it's argued that uh, this will exacerbate the inequality threat and security and risk identity voice and community and i think it is in you know sort of in this background and understanding some of these you know some understanding some of these issues we've just started our work on developing a toolkit for governments and for businesses on making smart cities compatible with business and human rights through alignment with the ungps potentially or other existing or future policy or legislative frameworks on business and human rights to enable that smart cities that integrate to enable that smart cities um, integrate business respect for human rights so i think what we're really looking for here is to develop this toolkit both for governments you know when this when they set expectations from the businesses on what needs to be done when they're moving you know when they're um, when they're contributing to developing these smart cities but then also for businesses how do they respect um, human rights when they are coming up with solutions and products that are going to contribute to these smart cities so i think these are to begin with you know maybe i can leave you here with these two uh, key initiatives you know both on the national action plan and the toolkit that we're developing and happy to answer any questions that you may have thanks so Thank you, Harpreet. Um, that was a lot of detail about the work that you're doing. Um, clearly, from your from your presentation, it brings out a lot of the complexities, right? That both governments and businesses are trying to navigate, and um, how important it is to indeed bring human rights to the forefront, right? Um, which is not always top of mind um, for. As you mentioned, for governments, as they think about national strategies, or for businesses, as they think about smart cities, um, perhaps you know, human rights are not top of mind, and they and they perhaps should be right. Um, so thank you so much for introducing some of these difficult um, tasks that you're working on together with your team, uh, and I'm sure we'll dive into you know some of the things that you have seen uh, a bit later on. Um, but before we do, I would like to uh, also introduce um, uh, the other Zoe, our other speaker and her work. And um, maybe uh, before we dive also into the work that you do, um, you could introduce a little bit of your background and uh, how come you're, you're working in this field. Thank you, Zoe, and thank you for Harpreet for that um, great introduction as well. 
Um, it is a pleasure to be able to share with you some of the work we've been doing here at the Australian Human Rights Commission. Um, I've been working on the Human Rights and Technology Project for about three and a half years now, and it has been a really exciting project um, to be involved with a national human rights institution's work at the forefront of this area. Um, it's so exciting because um, some of the work that I did previously um, through the NGO sector and also in private practice as a lawyer, um, I could see that technologies um, can somehow produce two completely different outcomes for people. We can have it being used as a great enabler and a great way of unlocking human rights enjoyment for many people in many ways. Um, and so in that sense, it's like an enabling right, being able to access and enjoy technologies. Um, on the other hand, I can see and we've seen how it can also produce great disadvantage and discrimination and end up excluding people. And so much depends on how technologies are designed and how they're used um, and how people can enjoy those technologies in society. So it's um, it's a really conflicting scenario, isn't it? Knowing that um, technologies themselves are generally neutral, but can produce such varying outcomes. And so it's been great to be able to do a deep dive into some of these issues and think about what the human rights risks are when it comes to especially new and emerging technologies. And so we've looked at two big themes in this realm. Um, the possibilities are endless really in terms of new technologies and how they're impacting us. Um, but we've decided to focus on two big issues here at the Human Rights Commission. And the first one is we've looked at how artificial intelligence in particular is being used in decision making and decision making that has a significant or similarly um, legal effect on us. Um, and then the second topic that we've looked at is accessible technology for people with disability. And in both of these topics, we see those um, extreme outcomes um, and the way that um, technology can be a great enabler, but then also um, it can be exclusive and it can discriminate. And so I look forward to getting into some of those details soon, but that's been really exciting to to be able to work on this project here at the Commission. Yeah, thank you for the intro, Zoe. And um, I think you rightly mentioned that you've been able to do a deep dive into this topic over the last uh, three and a half years. Um, if I'm not mistaken, your report on human rights and technology follows the largest ever consultation that has been uh, carried out by a national human rights institution. Um, so, you know, we would love to hear more about the process, uh, who you've spoken to and, and how you've sort of gone about this, this quite uh, ambitious project, right? Absolutely. Um, yes, it is the largest ever public consultation on human rights and AI. Um, and I will share some more details now with you about what our findings and recommendations are um, in this project. Um, I would like to acknowledge that I am in Sydney here in Australia and I do pay my respects to um, the traditional owners, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Um, as Zoe's mentioned, um, I been working on this project and I've already given you a bit of background um, and I'm going to focus specifically on our deep dive into artificial intelligence um, but very happy to move into our other topic as well if we get some questions on accessible technology for people with disability. Um, the project was led by the former Human Rights Commissioner Edward Santo um, and it has been this three year project to identify and address the risks to human rights by AI and other new technologies. And we consulted with government, industry, civil society and academia in Australia and worldwide. So we looked broadly at the commission at the 
topic of how we can best protect human rights when it comes to new technologies. But we did this deep dive on artificial intelligence used in making legal decisions or similarly significant decisions. And we're especially interested in AI because it engages human rights in a significant way and it may lead to unlawful discrimination in these types of decisions. We consulted with thousands of stakeholders and representative groups and we asked people about how AI is being used in their lives and how they expect the government and business use it in decision making about their lives. We followed a process that's similar to a law reform review process. We started with an issues paper three years ago, moved on to a discussion paper with a set of proposals and tested those proposals out with our stakeholders. And then we finally produce a, a final report this year, um, which has 38 recommendations for law and policy reform. We provided that report to the Attorney General and the Australian Government and made our recommendations on how Australia needs to protect human rights with these new technologies. So what were our key findings? Well, we know that new technologies present good opportunities to promote human rights, but they also raise serious human rights implications and risks of harm. International human rights law sets out globally accepted legal principles that uphold the dignity of all people. Human rights should be at the centre of Australia's approach to new technology. Ethical frameworks can be helpful in providing guidance in some situations, but they are not a substitute for regulation that protects our rights. Throughout the consultation, there was a clear message from citizens about the way that AI should be used to make a decision about them. They expect that AI would be used in a fair, accurate and accountable way. We found that Australians are not fearful of AI and its use in decision making. It was interesting that they were generally not too fussed about whether decisions that are made by government or by the private sector are made by AI or those decisions are made by people. But what citizens do care about is that significant decisions that are made about them are made in a way that is fair, accurate and accountable. So citizens have a clear vision that human rights be baked into the design of artificial intelligence and other new technologies. The final recommendations and findings of our project are now with the Australian government. And first of all, the big recommendation that we made as a commission to the government is that Australia needs a national strategy that has human rights at its centre. We need to set out now how present and future technologies will be used for our benefit. And national strategies help set a vision for that responsible innovation. So what are the key features of a national strategy? There are several countries, such as Germany, that have developed these strategies to guide their development and their use of new technology. And good strategies have some common elements. First of all, they incorporate international human rights standards, including practical steps to ensure protection of rights with accountability and grievance mechanisms. Secondly, they promote human rights training and education for designers of these new technologies. Thirdly, they include measures for oversight and policy development and monitoring of these new technologies. And finally, they focus on the present and future impacts of technologies on society more broadly. And so why are these elements so important in a national strategy? It's because we need to plan for how we want to benefit from these new and emerging technologies before they even develop sometimes. We need human rights embedded into our regulatory ecosystem so that we are prepared 
for those unforeseen and different risks that are emerging from new technologies. Australia has some elements in a strategy at the moment, but not all of these important ones. And so the Commission recommends the addition of a human rights approach and a commitment to education and training that supports better design of new technology. So how can we support governments to develop these kinds of strategies? Well, we really need to be able to articulate to our government the human rights risks that are posed by new technologies such as AI. And by exposing these risks, we can help demonstrate that a human rights approach provides a robust framework to identify and address those risks. A term that we hear a lot when it comes to the issues with AI used in these kinds of decisions is algorithmic bias. Algorithmic bias is when a tool, an AI tool, produces outputs that result in unfairness or discrimination that cannot be justified in the circumstances. Algorithmic bias is usually most detrimental for vulnerable groups or groups who are not equally represented in data sets, such as women or minorities. And this can lead to the engagement of civil, political, economic and social rights. And one of the ways that national human rights institutions can address these issues is through cross-sector collaborations. And the Commission partnered with data scientists last year to investigate the way that algorithmic bias can lead to unlawful discrimination. And we looked at ways to address these biases so as to avoid unlawful discrimination. The research was an important collaboration with technical experts, lawyers and policymakers. And it showed that AI systems must undergo rigorous design, testing and monitoring in the real world to identify and address this kind of bias. And we provided some practical guidance for data scientists and technicians in that paper. I'll just give you a brief overview of the recommendations from our final report and hand back to Zoe. First of all, what happened was our, we found that our recommendations, our 38 recommendations fell into three broad categories. The first category, is that we need to make sure that we apply the existing laws that we have in a better way. We already have our anti-discrimination law in Australia. We already have consumer laws to protect our rights, but we need to be able to apply these laws better when it comes to decisions where AI has been used. And this means that government and business need to understand their obligations better. For example, banks have always made predictions about who should get a loan. It's already unlawful to treat someone unfavorably because of their gender, for example. And so whether or not that decision was made by a human or an AI system, it has to be fair, accurate and accountable. The decision must not discriminate on the basis of a protected attribute like gender. So we need better application of existing law so that government and business are better equipped to design, procure and deliver services in ways that are human rights compliant when it comes to technologies like artificial intelligence. And we had a lot of positive engagement from the technology sector throughout this project. We heard from them that they want support to better design and deliver AI that protects human rights. You see, responsible businesses know that they have increased risks if they're not on the front foot with these issues. Businesses that don't respect human rights face a reputational risk. They face commercial risks in that they may end up breaking the law or losing customers due to inaccurate AI systems. There's a second category of recommendations and, and they encapsulate some specific areas of law reform that's needed in our Australian context to better protect human rights. 
And the focus of these recommendations is about better accountability from government and businesses. It's about them not using black box or opaque AI. It's about them making sure that people know when AI is being used in a significant decision about them and making sure that people have a right to reasons when AI is used in one of those decision-making processes. And the final category for reform that we recommend from the Commission is about capacity building for government, for national regulators and for the private sector. And in this respect, the government recommended that a new role be established, an AI safety commissioner, to promote safety and protect human rights. And this is specifically for the use of artificial intelligence in Australia. We say this should be an independent office that works with government and regulators and works alongside them to help build their technical capacity to monitor and investigate trends in the use of AI and to provide guidance to the government on how to comply with laws and ethical requirements. And we asked the government and national regulators what they need with the advent of AI. And they said they need increased capacity and, and expertise to carry out their existing functions. These new risks are emerging every month, every year, and they need the expertise to understand and address these risks. And so that's why we recommend a new AI safety commissioner, not to be a new regulator of AI, but to support the work of existing regulatory bodies who are facing the same problems they've always faced, but in new and supercharged ways due to artificial intelligence. And national human rights institutions are an important piece of the puzzle here. For example, the Australian Human Rights Commission is a complaints handling body. The commission, just like other national regulators, needs to be upskilled in how we respond to complaints where AI has been used in a significant decision about someone. So these technologies have been evolving so rapidly, we need help in executing our functions with expertise and knowledge. And finally, I'll just close by emphasizing how important public trust is in this whole puzzle. It is essential in the way that government and businesses use new technologies. A strong consultation theme all throughout this project was that public trust in AI and other new technologies is low. It must be rebuilt and strengthened. An AI safety commissioner is an important step to instilling public trust in the way that AI is used in significant decisions about Australians. So overall, accountable and fair and accurate AI is all about an essential public trust exercise. We need to make sure that AI is used in these ways when it comes to significant decisions about people. I'll leave it there and hand back to you now, Zoe. Thank you so much, Zoe, for that presentation. Um, I think that has really helped to build a little bit more understanding about the depth and the breadth of the work that you have done. Um, and I found it particularly interesting to hear some of the examples you mentioned on, you know, how banks are um, using AI to make decisions about who gets access to loans, for example. Um, and I would love to dive into a few more um, examples later on. Um, but maybe first, uh, I would like to invite Harpreet uh, to, to share a little bit, uh, since you mentioned you also do a lot of work on uh, national action plans. And we've just heard from Zoe how she works or how they have recommended, right, that the government does uh, incorporate human rights considerations into the national strategies. So does this, is this echoed in your work as well? Uh, does it cover the same angles? Uh, do you recognize some of the points that Zoe has just raised in the work that you are doing with national governments um, as well? 
And uh, just a small reminder to, to keep it slow so that our interpreters can also keep up. <laughs> Great. Thanks, so, um, thanks, Zoe, and thanks, Zoe P. Um, you know, I mean, I would, I would agree with everything that Zoe P and the research said. And I think that's something, you know, we kind of, in some ways, uh, in the work that we're doing, we all kind of knew these things and these important considerations. But I think um, the, the value of Zoe P's uh, research lies in sort of, you know, the number of, you know, and that scale and the depth of consultations that they have conducted with people. And I think that's what, I think that's what is really crucial here because, you know, she started by saying uh, it's important for us to know how technology is designed and how technology is used, right? And I think that's where it lies. You know, we have these, uh, you know, we want to make sure uh, people for whom the technology is being designed, I mean, one, they do have then equal access, uh, access and affordability to use this technology. But I think it's important for, um, you know, for especially for the for the governments who are looking at, you know, who are digitizing their economies more and more now is to sort of look at um, who are the people who are producing these technology, who are the ones, you know, behind the scenes, who are the ones who are developing this technology. And, you know, she did sort of also talk about, again, how some of these biases, you know, sort of would uh, could perpetuate uh, discriminatory practices in areas and, you know, scenes. And I think. Some of the key issues that we have seen, um, particularly in the context of, you know, uh, having conversations with on national action plans. Um, so, you know, we have been supporting, uh, organi we have been supporting organizing consultations. I mean, one is on the uh, baseline studies on business and human rights status in the each country as part of the national context when the governments are developing their national action plans. But then also we are supporting consultations with different stakeholders to understand the business and human rights situation in a country because again, the national, uh, you know, the national action plans needs to be contextualized according to the national context and what's happening sort of within that country and not having this one size fits all. And I think you know issues around issues around biases, issues around data privacies, and how I think you know most recently a lot of our consultations also. Um, also through issues about you know surveillance and particularly in the context of you know surveillance and how ai is being used um, um, you know for war, warfare as well as surveillance practices and how that could also ex uh, how that could pose risk to particularly you know human rights defenders and i think that's something that kept coming in many of the con you know in many of the consultations and conversations that we were having mm -hmm. with um, you know with uh, with these people um, i think another key issue that came up is how ai can also perpetuate as i said discriminatory practices but across areas you know for example policing uh, judicial decisions or employment I mean, also because now if you look at how judicial decisions are being made and, you know, there is, you know, and we're talking, I mean, access to remedies still remains one of the weakest pillar among the UNGPs. And you know, if you have this AI that's deciding, uh, you know, that's that's helping you decide uh, on, you know, who would get access to remedy, I think there's there, there are serious portions and there are serious human rights risks in, in there as well. Um, you know, we kind of often tend to forget that uh, AI also transforms the link between the warfare and surveillance practices that I was saying earlier. You know, the use of these uh, legal autonomous weapon systems that would put um, autonomous, you know, these robotic systems in charge of the life and death decisions in some ways with very, very limited uh, or no human control at all. And I think uh, one of the key issues that has been raised in various consultations is about how governments and businesses can again use uh, machine learning to analyze drone surveillance footage, which can be used to target, uh, which can be used to target defenders. And I think, uh, you know, in here, we also need to sort of understand, uh, you know, the intersectional dimensions of gender discrimination that could, uh, you know, that could be impacted here. You know, if, um, you know, if uh, companies, you know, when, when we're looking at the states and businesses, I think they need to keep in mind these intersectional dimensions of gender discrimination. Otherwise, the, the products that they design, you know, otherwise the solution that they give, you know, I mean, even despite good intentions, you know, to sort of gender neutral technology, you know, should impact everybody equally. I think they would fall short of, um, you know, they would, they would, you know, I think they would kind of widen this gender divide as well. I mean, think about 
uh, think about the impacts on local income women you know sort of low income women single mothers women of color migrant women uh, women with disability i mean they would all they may be differently impacted by ai and automation and would have differentiated needs and expectations and i think this is something that kind of kept coming in many of the conversations that we were having with uh, with different stakeholders you know the other um, i think the other key issue that came up in many of our consultations was all about you know the robotization and automation of jobs i mean of course it will impact both men and women but uh, a lot of conversation has been about how gender bias is likely to carry forward and you know if if the ai is uh, if the ai is not designed appropriately with inputs from women and it could impact women disproportionately i mean for example look at the sectors where you do have majority of workers i mean i'm looking at asia right now and i'm looking at the uh, garment supply chains i mean if you look at this uh, a large majority 3/4 of your workers are women so you know when you bring in ai uh, when you bring in ai when you bring in automation of jobs it is definitely going to impact more women than men so i think when we're looking at many of these solutions um, you know these were some of the points that sort of kept coming and i think and therefore the therefore the expectations from the government and businesses to understand these ways that the that the machine learning this ai or the you know new technologies overall could impact could impact people differently and therefore understand uh, while they're developing the disproportionate impacts that they could have on different uh, on different set of stakeholders um i think that's where you know that's maybe you know that's something that i would like to end this particular um, section with is you know uh, is is it's not a homogeneous group of people who are going to use your ai or machine learning or new technologies in a way i think this heterogeneity needs to be acknowledged needs to be understood you know not just in terms of the users but also and but also in the need uh, you know in the context of the people who are developing this so it's important to have it's important to bring in these data sets that are sex disaggregated these data sets that are disaggregated by different um, you know different elements and i think that's um, so you know uh, we need to sort of bring in diversity both in the development both in the development and the designing stage and therefore reflecting on how different users could have access to these technologies thanks Thank you so much, uh, Harpreet, for your answer and also for giving some some very real and very impactful examples, right? Um, and I think, as I mentioned previously, I would love to to dive into some examples more um, of where you have seen AIs or other emerging technologies sort of lead to intended or unintended discrimination. And then also what remedial action was attempted and whether or not it was successful. Um, if it was successful, great, we have a solution. But if it wasn't successful, uh, we have a point for learning from that as well, right? Um, so I would love to hear if you could share perhaps um, one or two examples that you thought was, were really interesting uh, from your work. Um, and maybe I will invite uh, Zoe to go first and then Harpreet also to share. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I think I might draw on some of that work that I mentioned where the commission collaborated with some data scientists to do um, an interesting investigation into how algorithmic bias can creep into AI decisions to provide some practical examples um, to help illustrate exactly what you're talking about, Harpreet, in terms of that that gender bias, which is a real concern, um, especially when it comes to the use of an AI tool that's not designed for that context or that's, you know, perfectly right for that um, that group or that um, for, for good outcomes. And so what we did was we looked at an example which was um, hypothetical, but based on real life experience. So we know that when businesses are thinking about um, offering products to potential customers, um, they might use large data sets um, to analyze those customers and um, offer particular uh, 
I guess, deals or um, products, depending on whether a customer is considered to be a profitable customer. And so we used an everyday example, but it was the provision of energy, which is an essential service, having electricity and gas to your home. So what we did was um, we had a simulated data set, but again, based on reality. And so made up of thousands of data points, looking at different demographics. Um, and so we had various um, features in that data set. Uh, this was obviously all orchestrated and designed by the data scientists who know what they're doing. Um, and so they had um, features in there such as gender, postcode um, and age and income, all of these data points add up to what could be described as like a credit rating. And so um, the electricity company is able to look at this big data set and say, okay, here's the ones, here are the customers who are going to be most profitable. Here's the group we're going to offer the best products to. And so we looked at how bias can creep into the different stages throughout that selection process uh, in the data set and then also in an AI system. And it was really interesting looking at the different ways that bias creeps in. If we think about bias in everyday life, we know that already there's societal inequalities um, that we live with even before you think about a data set, even before you think about AI. And so we looked at an example where there is a pay disparity between um, people who live in Australia who are of Indigenous backgrounds, so Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, who on average have a lower income than non-Aboriginal people in Australia. And so that's already a societal inequality. And so the data scientists were able to help address that inequality in the data set and in the AI system by making sure that there were um, more people chosen um, from th that background who could be included as profitable customers. Um, and so this was just an example about how um, even though the bias existed before we even talked about a data set and an AI system, we can actually see how AI can be used to produce good outcomes and be involved with redressing societal inequalities. So that was a good outcome in that circumstance. Um, and that example helped show that we can address those issues with good design of an AI system in the right context. Another example quickly that I wanted to share is a really interesting gender bias example where what happened was the data scientists looked at a data set where the historical nature of that data set um, meant that there was a bias that crept in through the data set, which then was fed into the AI system. And so because the data was old, and it showed a greater pay disparity between men and women, that meant that less women were chosen as profitable customers in the outputs of that AI system. So in that context, sometimes people might say, well, the best thing to do is to get rid of gender in the, in the data set so that we're not even looking, about, looking at gender and worrying about it. And so the first step was the data scientists took out gender from the data set, but the AI tool was smart enough to be able to adapt and find a proxy for gender. And instead of using gender um, to discriminate against women, it used a proxy of um, the person's internet browsing history, which can be correlated with gender. And so the AI system learnt how to still continue to discriminate against women unintentionally, um, but nevertheless still discriminate in its outputs. And so the solution in that context for that AI tool was not to get rid of gender as a feature, but to keep it in there and make sure that the data scientists and the designers had updated data and make sure that the 
that was able to be reflected in the data set and the AI system for much more accurate and fair outcomes. So that was a really interesting exercise where we looked at a few examples like that, where particular groups in the Australian community were being disadvantaged or discriminated against because of their particular features or characteristics. And we showed that this can be quite dire in terms of the outcomes and in fact, um, lead to forms of discrimination. But these are not insurmountable problems. Um, good data scientists um, who understand their context and who are involving um, stakeholders in the design and development of these tools can identify and address these issues in the design, the use, and especially the monitoring phases. So it's important to think about how these are actually playing out in society and looking at the ongoing monitoring of the use of AI in the community, especially for unintended consequences. Thank you so much, Zoe, for sharing those examples. Um, it's really fascinating how we can uh, design for more equality um, and also to see how the AI might even be a bit smarter than we think and, you know, still find ways to discriminate even when we try to omit that, right? Uh, so that's really fascinating. And, and, and as you mentioned, not insurmountable, but really important to be aware of and, and to monitor, right, as, as we go along. Um, Harpreet, would you, would you be able to share some of, the, some of these examples as well that you've seen in your work and how you try to remedy it, uh, whether you're successfully or not? Sure. Thanks, Zoe. Uh, we aren't, um, you know, I have to acknowledge that we are not as advanced in our research and our work on artificial intelligence and, you know, this entire topic, you know, as much as OEP and, you know, and the Institute and the Commission is. But, you know, um, I think some of the ways, you know, a lot of our work, as I said, focuses on supporting the governments in developing these national action plans, but then also developing tools and guidance, you know, raising awareness and building capacity of, you know, building capacity of different stakeholders. Um, and, you know, I may not have a very sort of, you know, uh, direct examples here to share, but, uh, you know, again, some of the work that we're doing right now is we're conducting, we're organizing trainings, um, you know, for the businesses and the policymakers to understand women, business and human rights, you know, that nexus, but then also, um, you know, in this particular case, we're looking at, uh, we actually have sort of, you know, uh, uh, distinguished between women, business, and human rights to identify and to sort of help policymakers and the businesses and technology companies are, you know, one of the targeted companies here to sort of understand when they are thinking about their, you know, when they're thinking about their products, when they're thinking about their um, consumers, you know, understand understand that, you know, women would be disproportionately impacted by, by the work that these companies do, you know, by the products of these companies. So, so, so what businesses need to do to ensure that they respect women's rights. So that's something that, you know, that's, um, in fact, we've just sort of started, um, I think the trainings are now lined up sort of in, in mid-December with the businesses on that and with policymakers. Similarly, we're looking at sort of, you know, how do we help implement the corporate standards to respect LGBTI, within the business, you know, within the workplaces, within the businesses and what businesses need to do. And I think, so what we are really doing in our work is sort of, you know, bringing, um, you know, creating awareness about some of these issues through our research. Um, and as I said, you know, one of the research and, uh, you know, that we're using right now to develop the toolkits uh, for the smart cities, digital economy is, you know, where we're looking at these different, uh, you know, these different um, interconnections. And I think that's something that we would, um, hopefully by the you know next forum we would have more to share in terms of you know this toolkit but then also at the forums um, next year I think the other uh, you know the other key uh, aspect which we have started looking at and uh, you know so we sort of talked about consumption you know sort of the online history uh, in you know in your shopping history and you know uh, we've just started looking at you know how do we engage youth um, in, in the field of business and human rights. And we're bringing in behavioral sciences and we're bringing in data scientists to sort of understand the space of responsible consumption among young people. And again, um, really, really new um, area for us to sort of start. But I think what we're really trying to understand here is also, you know, when we're thinking of, when we're thinking of the responsible consumption among young people, how, what does it mean? 
and how is it impacted you know by by the advertisements for example that you see on your on your social media pages or you know how you are targeted so i think that's something that we're really looking forward to understand how all of this space works the role that ai and uh, and the new technologies play in in targeting young you know in targeting the youth and also sort of understanding the diversity among youth and i think those are some of the um, you know some of the initiatives that we've sort of started looking at um, right now i also see so if, if there's time i think this question for me uh, and i'm happy to answer right now unless you're going to wait ahead. yeah no for go it. for it go for it sure um so you know um thanks uh, thank you um for you know for uh, for that question you know in fact one of the points that you've raised is a really important point and you know there was this there is this report from unesco um which was launched in 2019 it says i'd blush if i could which is you know famous uh, you know one of the famous quotes from when siri uh, was originally designed um and i think you know the the report explains about how um, and you know the report kind of explains about how this ai and some of the terminologies that we use are so are so connected with the genders and you know some of the roles that are so connected with the gender so you know um, if you really see how virtual personal assistants such as siri alexa cortana i mean they have all female names and come with the default female voice um and, you know we were kind of conducting research in terms of sort of understanding the space and actually we realized you know if you analyze it further you would hear the words that these or you know the commands that these virtual women virtual assistants would use you know it was it was it was all about sort of submissive behavior it was about i'm here to serve you right you know so that's the kind of you know that's the kind of um um that's the kind of you know bias or you know that's the kind of messages that the women virtual assistants would say but on the other hand we also looked at the other uh, virtual assistants that are supposedly men and you know these were all these are all portrayed as experts these are you know uh, these are also again you know advisors people with authority so i think you know even if you sort of start looking at this space of virtual assistant i mean we have bots uh, almost for everything and anything that we work on right now and i think that's where the question become relevant is you know when we're looking at market when you're looking at you know somebody who's a bread earner you know uh, the ai is tagging that bread earner as a man and not as a woman and you know therefore this market concept you know these are the people who are these are the people who are making your financial supposedly financial decisions because they do have the financial resources to be able to spend and i think those are some of the critical issues that um, you know you've rightly sort of um, uh, pointed and that's something that you know ai needs to look at because i think all of this would eventually what you know where it would lead you know the um, again your decision making if it's going to come through ai and machines uh, it could lead to again the gender pay gaps it would even sort of widen the gender pay gaps and i think that's something you know when you're looking at this in the context of the markets in the context of the business i think it's really important that we um, that we identify uh, acknowledge these biases and therefore sort of start planning on how are we going to uh, how are we going to address these biases um, in in the new technologies thanks Yeah thank you so much Harpreet and um I think some of the things you mentioned you know uh, there there's a point where it goes beyond the technology and where we are facing biases that are entrenched in our societies in our legal systems right and you know technology cannot solve them if 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 the society isn't sort of ready to solve them right so you know it's it's always a sort of interplay between you know the status of of a nation and that society and how technology can help um can i oh sorry didn't mean to interrupt there zoe can i pick up on one of those points when you've totally. when you finished no yep. go for it please oh, <laughs> just picking up on what you've been both been talking about one of the really interesting things and unsurprising of course um that we found in our consultation was that businesses that are making a concerted effort to have diverse teams of designers when it comes to new technologies um are pointing to really kind of um inclusive outcomes and so of course it's not a surprise that if you have a team um that has um men and women and a whole range of um 
strengths um, in, you know, in, included in that team means that they end up with much more inclusive technologies at the end of their design and development process and a lot more satisfied customers <laughs> as a result. Um, and this was especially clear when it came to the work that we did on accessible technology, where some businesses have made um, a concerted effort to make sure that they have people with disability in their design teams, meaning that they end up with much more accessible and usable and inclusive technologies at the end. And I just, I think about some of those examples you were sharing, Harpreet, about the virtual assistants and so forth in terms of um, the designers behind these technologies. And and it's you know, so easy just to think about um, what those design teams could or probably look like. Um, and so how important it is to make sure that we are inclusive right back at the beginning in terms of thinking about who is going into studying um, the profession of science, technology, engineering and maths, um, thinking about STEM um, as being an inclusive education and professional career for people. Yeah, thank you so much, Zoe. And I think, again, that is something that is often probably overlooked, right? Um, it can be hard for design teams to, uh, to imagine, right, what the lived reality of other people are. And of course, the best way to ensure that is to make sure that you have an inclusive design team. Um, and thanks also for pointing out that that starts in the education system oftentimes, right? Um, I think as we are nearing towards the end of the session, I would like to invite anyone uh, from the audience, if you have questions, comments or feedback for our speakers, to please uh, pop them in the chat or in the Q&A now so that we still have some time uh, to, to get to them. Um, and in the meantime, let me just uh, ask uh, another question. Um, as we talk about inclusive digital economies, of course, it's a very broad topic, right? Uh, national digital transformation is, is high on the, on the radar of many governments um, and businesses are happy, happy to participate. I think um, also some of the things you mentioned with smart cities, Harpreet, is that um, access, right? Access and inclusion into some of these products is sort of key. And I'd like to ask a little bit more about a financial inclusion, right? Financial inclusion is a topic that has been around for a long time. Many governments have policies and strategies uh, around financial inclusion. And I'm wondering, uh, what do you think is the opportunity or risk of um, AI or other emerging technologies to, to hinder or to help financial access and financial inclusion? Um, whoever wants to go first can go first. Sure. Um, thanks, Zoe, for that question. I may not have, um, you know, sort of all the right answers to your question, but I think, but, you know, I'm kind of now reflecting in the context of uh, COVID-19 and I'm looking at sort of, you know, internet. And, you know, I, you know, we're talking about, um, you know, I was just sort of reading newspaper this morning um, and, and there was this one article that talks about how, you know, about one fourth of the children in India did not have access to Internet while all the education system were online last year. And I think that's kind of, you know, an impact on, you know, we're looking at this impact and we're looking at the financial inclusion in, the, in, in this, you know, in sort of in this context and you know internet is like such a basic requirement for everything that you're going to use you know whether you're going to have to pay your bills whether you have to recharge um, you know any of your accounts whether you get your payments in your banks I mean you do need internet for that right and that's kind of you know internet of all the things and and your financial um, uh, and you know your financial capacity to buy these data you know data plans or you know access internet I think really depends I mean, think of I mean, think of think of the people who are going to have access to internet, and I mean, think of vaccines. You know, even in that context, you know, a lot of countries, uh, including India, for example, had you know, you have to register to this uh, website, you know, Coven, which is an app, and that's how you're going to go and be able to access vaccines. Now, think about people who would have access to that. You know, these are all elite, educated. 
uh, high class uh, people in the societies that would have access to these and i think financial you know your financial um, capacities play a huge role and you know who are the people who are left behind in that space women people of color migrant workers and you know your marginalized communities and i think that's somewhere you know when you need to sort of start looking at um when you start when you need looking at the new technologies and i think uh, you know as i said uh, people who were already left behind uh, because of you know the structural inequalities and you know and discriminatory norms if we are not looking at these um, you know if if the ai and the new technologies are not designed in a in an appropriate way this could further uh, deepen inequalities uh, including you know and and i think the you know your financial uh, status kind of really does impact uh, in in big ways how you're going to access vaccines how you're going to you know uh, get access to different uh, different uh, facilities and products that you may require thank you so much hyper yes yes very important and i think that uh, access to internet has been announced as a as a declared a human right as well and it of course closely ties in with with financial access and inclusion um, Zoe, would you would you care to comment as well? Um, yes, I'd like to just second everything that um, Harpreet said. That was a really key finding in our consultation, especially in the last 18 months during the pandemic time, when um, a lot of our stakeholders were able to provide practical examples of how previously they'd already felt and been digitally excluded. But now during the pandemic, that was exacerbated and heightened. And it became clearer that there's a greater disparity between those who are digitally included and those who are excluded. And all of the follow on implications um, that means for people such as financial inclusion um, and, and other forms of, of enjoyment of rights um, were exposed, have been exposed even more so throughout the pandemic. I just add in uh, one example which you might like to look into further, and that is um, uh, one where the Australian government instituted a type of automated decision making system several years ago, um, and it was to do with the recovery of debts for those who had been paid social security payments um, in Australia, and it was called the Centrelink Debt Recovery system or scheme um, and it, it got nicknamed robo debt um, because what happened was uh, a, a kind of automated match up between the records in our tax office national tax system along with um, the records of Centrelink which is the social security government agency and it was quite a basic analysis of these figures um, and matching them up for particular individuals. Um, and it goes to show in this example um, how something that doesn't have a human in the loop or human in oversight can really impact um, the outcomes of a system like this. Um, just thinking about financial inclusion and making sure that people have access to their social security payments, um, a basic right. And what happened in this scenario was um, something that is a legitimate um, aim, and that is the government pursuing debts um, or payments that shouldn't have been made to someone and having them recouped is a legitimate aim of a government but the way that it was executed and carried out meant that thousands of debt recovery letters were sent out to Australians and the first um, they often knew about it was when um, a debt officer was on their doorstep and this has led to some huge um, issues in Australia over the last few years and there's been inquiries into um, the harmful impacts on people and communities. Um, but it sadly is um, a really key example of how um, a system which um, yeah, is, is about, um, which may have a legitimate aim for a government um, and these administrative decisions need to make sure that they are designed well and that there is a human involved in these decisions before, um, before they actually impact people um, in, in everyday life. Thank you so much, both of you, for, for sharing your, 
your insights and your examples on this. And um, I think as we're wrapping up, I would like to sort of rephrase one of the questions that has come in from Vanuatu. And it builds on both of your comments that it's important to have uh, diverse perspectives, right? Both in design, decision-making and monitoring. Um, since a lot of the work that is being done on national strategies, uh, policies and regulation is done by the government, right? It would be important to have more diverse representation, right? In parliament and in decision-making roles. Um, and so what do you think would be the best ways to go about that? Should there be quotas? Should there be, um, you know, reserved seats to ensure participation of diverse stakeholders in government? Um, and do you think that would lead to better outcomes as we navigate these emerging technologies uh, that are entering all of our digital economies? Uh, Zoe, might I ask you to respond first? And also this might be uh, our closing, closing comments in a way, right? So please. Thank you, and thank you for the question. Um, it's really highlighted um, something that has been quite dear to us as we've been working on this project. And like I said, it's been very important and it's become um, very obvious throughout this process that those who are making the decisions have a huge impact on the way that these um, technologies are designed and used. And as you say, those who are um, making these strategies and these plans obviously have a huge impact on the way um, that it will, it will affect um, the nation and the communities it involves. And so, yes, yeah, it's, it's been our findings and our experience from all of our stakeholders who've been involved that um, those teams and those leadership teams where there is a, a, a great diversity um, and inclusive uh, dynamic um, and and deliberately inclusive as well. Um, there's that's they're the ones that have reported really positive, inclusive, and accessible outcomes. And so we would definitely um, promote that kind of inclusiveness and diversity in leadership teams and in design teams. Um, that's something that has has really come through in our project and consultation. Um, and I think I might just say um, as my last 30 seconds um, uh, that, yeah, it is a really, this is such a, a great topic and I'm really glad that everyone's been able to be involved in this session and I hope um, that we can keep thinking about how to build these inclusive digital economies and making sure that um, everyone is involved and included and that the technology is enabling and empowering for all and not just some. Thank you Zoe, thank you so much. Harpreet? Would you like to add? Um, thanks, no, I again, um, agree with everything that Zoe P said, um, and you know, couldn't really agree more with this. I think it's important to have, uh, you know, we've all seen how diverse teams have always, you know, resulted, um, resulted in sort of, you know, much equal uh, products and designs. So I think, but, you know, also again, just saying that, you know, we, it's not, it's, it's, it's really important to, you know, have, uh, diverse seats at the people, but I think, you know, at the table, but I think it's not just about the seat, you know, it's also about, you know, giving, giving these diverse, uh, you know, giving these diverse stakeholders also a microphone and an enabling environment where you're not discriminating people because of, you know, their, uh, because of their age, their gender, their race, their religion. And I think that's where, you know, it really is, is you know, it all comes down to, you know, we've seen also in many places, you know, especially, um, you know, especially where we've had quotas, is, you know, they may have a seat at the table, but not so much of a voice. And I think therefore the value of having, um, you know, diverse leadership teams, I think, and then, and then enabling environment there, you know, so that these leadership values also trickle down uh, in your organization. And I think that's really important to bring, um, you know, to bring, um, to bring a real change and ensuring that um, you know, not just technology, but any of the decisions that we are making um, are, are impacting equally everyone. And, and also, I think, take into account, uh, take into account some of the impacts that some of the disproportionate impacts that some, uh, some sectors and, you know, some, uh, some stakeholders may have. So I think it's really, again, um, you know, important to have not just the seat, but also the microphone and the enabling environment. And I think that's uh, with that I would like to close. Thanks, Zoe. 
Thank you so much, Hartfried. Um, and thank you both for making time to share your insights with us today. Um, I hope it's been enriching uh, to you both and also to all of our attendees. Um, we've come to the end of the session uh, and I will hand back over to our host, Robert. Um, but before I do so, allow me to thank our sign interpreters for their excellent and dedicated work in this session. Uh, thank you very much for facilitating as well. Thank you. Thank you, Zuri, and thanks to all the amazing panelists. I think this was a really super interesting uh, session uh, for me personally as well. Uh, area of business and human rights I don't know that much about. So really uh, a really great place to learn. I'm so happy that this session took place.